Hi, hey, folks. Finn here. We're going to be looking at the cavity embalming chapter now. This is an insanely important chapter. So in general, we've been treating viscera for a very long time. However, we don't usually do the whole evisceration, rip out the guts and treat them separately anymore. That kind of disappeared uh, right before the industrial age. They were still doing some of that, you know, Egyptian practice sort of wannabe stuff in the Middle Ages, but realistically after the Civil War, we got away from it. Uh, even back when it was the major way of doing things, um, we recognized the fact as embalmers that if we did not treat the viscera, anything else we did would be a waste of time. And when Samuel Rogers in 1878 invented the trocar for direct uh, treatment of the cavities, it made our job so much easier. The need to treat these items following arterial injection is because there's all sorts of junk in there. Look at all this stuff. Um, it is going, you know, if we left the things alone, gases would form with swelling, the bacteria would, would multiply and thrive because of all the media that they have to um, survive on. Just lots and lots of bad things for us. And when we arterially inject, the contents of the hollow organs, the bladder, that's not touched. So we have no way of knowing if the walls and tissue of those organs have received preservative, and certainly the contents did not. Aspiration injection are designed to reach the organs and contents of the thoracic, abdominal, pelvic, and even cranial cavities. And this is not a visible procedure. We poke the abdomen with the trocar, and we kind of cross our fingers and hope we do our job right. Um, Obviously, we will retreat if necessary. It's a two-step process. The first thing we do is we empty the contents to the best of our ability in aspiration. Okay? And then we inject a strong preservative to disinfect and preserve anything in the cavities. And this generally occurs after embalming because we're poking holes in the arteries that are holding our preservative. So sometimes, and we're going to you know, talk about when you should go immediately and when you should let it sit uh, throughout the book. You may be restricted. So if we're going to be um, disposing of a body by sending it to the medical school, we're not going to do cavity injection because the medical schools do not want us to do that. Uh, and sometimes we may only be able to cavity inject because um, the family does not want arterial injection. We can ask for this separately in an effort to disinfect the body further. So chronology, we start with arterial embalming, okay? We can treat some of the abdominal cavity prior to or during arterial injection if um, we start getting swelling in the abdomen. So it says if there is ascites, which is generalized, or I'm sorry, not generalized edema, but edema of the abdomen, uh, and if there is gas distension. Limited aspiration of thorax if you have gas up there because you run the risk of puncturing something you don't want to puncture. So the time of when we do this, we generally are going to do it either immediately after arterial injection, and there are criteria for you will do this immediately for certain categories, or several hours later after we've had time for the arterial solution to do its job. And the suggested order is real simple. You start at the top, the most superior, and you work your way down. Thorax, abdomen, pelvic, tap. We then inject a cavity chemical, and then we close the hole, either a trocar button or a purstring suture, which you'll read about in the next chapter. Wash dry the remains. After the period of time, if we have some concerns, we may re-aspirate, take out what we put in, and then re-inject, if necessary, more cavity fluid. So microbes don't die with us. That's what basically causes us to decompose, is the bugs. They go crazy because we no longer have an immune system. Uh, and some of those guys start running around your body during the agonal period before you're even dead, via the bloodstream, lymph system, and even just tissue spaces. Cavity treatment is going to destroy not just the microbes, but the stuff they feed on. So it is a double disinfection process, so to speak. Um, and this chart is important. You should be able to pretty much figure out what's going to fall into any one of these categories. Um, Someone says, you know, what could you be aspirating from the small intestine? You need to know what it is. Urinary bladder. Well, you're going to kind of figure that urine is the big one there, but also pus-forming material and even blood in some cases. 
Here are the solid organs treated by cavity embalming. I would definitely know what those are. Um, undigested and partially digested foodstuffs in the stomach and intestines are removed during proper aspiration so that they do not cause more of a problem than they should. Anything left inside is going to react with cavity fluid. Well, the problem is the more of something that reacts with cavity fluid, the more cavity fluid is needed to do its job properly. So if we remove as much of this as possible, then we won't have the complications of pressure causing things to leak from um, the external orifices. So generally with cavities, it uh, tells you the most common item. You can see blood and edema is a given for everybody. So what I would do is I would just probably memorize the ones that does not have purulent material, which is the pericardial part. Okay, so you're going to have no gas and no pus-forming materials. And I would memorize cranial, where we have nothing pus-forming, but we might have gas. Everything else is a, tri is a uh, in this case, a quadfecta, is the trifecta. Materials do not just decompose. They can serve as media for bacteria and an additional diluent for cavity chemical. And as I've stated, the more there is to embalm, the less chemical actually goes around. Mouth purge originates from either lung, stomach, or throat. If there's no hole going directly through, it's not going to purge. So people say, oh, it, you can get uh, mouth purge from the small intestine. Probably not. Okay? It's got to go through the pyloric sphincter, get into the stomach, and then work its way up. That's probably not going to happen. Uh, throat purge can also be a result of vein hemorrhage, okay, a vein hemorrhage. Nose purge, same exact thing, same exact thing, because connected to the same pipe. Rectal purge, no-brainer. Intestinal, possibly stomach, generally intestinal, generally intestinal, or even rectal hemorrhage. You might have a, a bleed out uh, because of a punctured hemorrhoid or something. Cranial purge is very rare. Use a result of uh, trauma, fracture of the temporal bone. Usually comes out in the ear but can cause distension to purge from the nose or eyes. You can see the Milky Way fluid leaking from the tear ducts or something. Generally, it's problematic. Uh, some diseases may cause gases to build in the brain or meninges, which cause cranial purge. Yeah, so if you have like meningitis or something like that, that could be an issue for you. So the four mean of the eyes, the holes of the eyes, foramen magnum, remember the hole in the, in the skull for the spine? Well, this is the same exact sort of thing, the holes for the eyes. They serve as pathways for anything in the cranium to leak out. And it tells you what they all are, the optic foramen, blah, blah, blah. Know what those are. With cranial purge, we're going to go in through the nose and we're going to treat it. Okay? We're going to go into the nose and treat it. Hydrocephalus which is a normal accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid in the brain, does not necessarily need to be treated. Some embalmers treat the brain on every body. Some do not. Uh, I could not tell you with regular frequency that I have treated the brain. I certainly don't do it on every body. Uh, preparation of the un uh, unautopsied stillborn or infant. You should treat the cranium because the brain can decompose very quickly. And part of that is because the moisture uh, component of infants and stillborns is very high. They have a much higher water content. Uh, and you might have to use something like a large hypodermic needle, you know, a, a lower gauge hypodermic needle rather than a trocar because that would be too invasive. If you were to say, Professor Finn, what's some of the most important things that I need to know that most likely might be on your test or any professional exam? I'm going to tell you, you need to tell me the types of purge, what they looked at, and where they come from. This chart is pure gold. Okay, this chart right here is pure gold. You should be able to tell me the colors. You should be able to tell me the orifice they come out and where it originates from. So what do you need to do with this? Simple. Mr. Pointy, some tubing, and something that creates a vacuum, some suction device. For injection, you need everything that we had before with the exception of something that pushes fluid. So either a um, pressure device or some sort of gravity injector. Closure, only two ways to close it. You either sew it shut with a purse string or end suture, or use a trocar button, which is what most of us then default to the suture if the button doesn't work. Uh, and you do need a specific type of applicator for the button. Okay, trocar button applicator is specific to our industry. After you're done, you disinfect your tools. And we'll talk about how to disinfect some of these larger ones. So how do we create a vacuum? How do we get to suck things out of these hollow viscera, and all these fluids and whatnot. Well, the first item is called the hydroid. It's installed on a cold water line, preferably over a sink. Uh, when turned on, you turn on the water, 
vacuum is created. Water runs through it and creates a vacuum. Usually has a vacuum breaker attached to it. Now, some manufacturers sell this as one unit where you have the aspirator and the uh, vacuum breaker as one. Some of them you have to buy the components separate. Make sure you know which one you're getting. And basically, it prevents against backflow. If something backs up, it immediately shuts down so it doesn't flow back into um, your aquifer and mess up your funeral home's water. A few ounces of material in an aspirator, because it gets aerated especially, seems like a lot. Um, you might have to take the trocar out. You might have to let it drain the tube and then go back in, so just to make sure that you're not clogged up. Uh, a sound change in the hydro aspirator gets higher, indicates that probably something has become clogged. Water then reduces, maybe go into the body. Now, what that means, if it actually gets through into the system, okay, and clogs it so that it can no longer form a vacuum, then water will back up and blow into the body. It's why you want that vacuum breaker. That will then purge it into the sink that it's over. Um, if your trocar is just clogged, that is not going to be an issue. Nothing's going to happen. You're not going to be sucking anything out. You're not going to be backflowing. If it can't be flushed out, you have an issue. You're going to have to clean the trocar by hand. Generally, you can pretty much blow out, for the most part, anything that goes into a trocar. Uh, there are various ways of dealing with it. Some people will sit there and run some water over the top. Uh, what I will do here in our lab is I will put it completely down the drain, hold the um, hose onto the back of the trocar since we don't use a quick release on it, and then reverse my water flow in an attempt to push something out. And if I feel that that is successful and I can you know, establish that everything is blowing out, then I will reverse it, suck everything back in, no harm, no foul. If I feel that you know, I cannot do it, then yes, we're going to be breaking out the pipe cleaners and having some fun. An electric aspirator does everything a hydro aspirator does, but plugs into your wall. It uh, has a little impeller that creates the suction. Uh, these come in both a um, pump that needs lubricating and also a um, sealed pump, which has lubricant already inside, don't have to worry about. These are usually a hell of a lot more expensive. Hydro aspirator might cost you, even with a vacuum breaker, you know, 200 bucks tops. Uh, aspirator, electric aspirator, probably going to cost you over 1000 or close to 1000 And they usually require more maintenance. Um, preferred for areas where you have very low water pressure. You absolutely have to have the machine. Um, sometimes you might actually double dip. You know, you'll chain these things together to get a more, um, a more powerful form of vacuum. Some of these also, uh, electric aspirators, some of these have an attachment so you can add disinfectant so that what you're then, you know, putting down the drain will have some type of disinfected solution. The hand pump, very rarely we use this today. You can usually find them on auction sites or antique stores. Um, used to remove air and force air into enclosed airtight container. So basically this was used for both injection and aspiration. Uh, drawing the air out of the container creates a suction, had a glass jar. But the problem was is if it did have a fracture or a small crack or something in the jar, you could actually implode the jar, which is why you should not be using these if you have any choice uh, in the matter. Same thing with the air pressure machine. It works in the same principle as a hand pump, except now it's a machine. Uh, and for obvious reasons, there's even a higher danger of glass implosion because you don't even feel it. It just kind of happens. But it fills the jar, and then you throw the jar into the, um, into the pipe. Trocars, your boy Sam Rogers, 1878. Um, long hollow needle or metal tube with a fixed or removable sharp point that is available in varying lengths or bores. The standard for trocars is 18 inches long, 5 16 bore for adults. Okay? Um, does everything that we need. And we can sharpen the points. If you have removable ones, uh, you can throw them away after a while and they start getting rusty or something. And with the non-removable, you just break out the old stone that you use to sharpen your needles and do the same thing here. Infant trocars are 12 inches and a quarter inch in bore, okay? And it tells you the uses for them. Complete disinfection of your trocars is very important because of cross-contamination. We generally do not have four or five trocars sitting around the uh, funeral home. One, maybe two is all we have. Uh, and you need to have, because of their length, the appropriate type of container to disinfect them. So what type of tubing should we use if we're going to be, um, you know, sucking stuff out and putting stuff in? Clear. Clear plastic or rubber tubing. 
three uh, eighths inch to a half inch are used, and they have to have a thick enough wall so that as you are aspirating, the tube doesn't collapse. That would defeat the purpose. So many of us use something like a vinyl tubing. You could also use a um, semi-transparent reinforced tubing if you want to see some people do that. I don't prefer it. It's too rigid for me. Um, nasal tube aspirator, this little guy, um, very, very small, 3 16 bore, used for nasal or cranial cavities, and this thing is easily clogged. Place through the nasal opening or between the lips. If you try to force it down the back of the neck, uh, the soft tissues of the tongue and throat will clog the holes. This is not something that's for major work. And the last guy is the autopsy aspirator, usually 8 to 10 inches long, 3 8 bore. And we use this for putting into the uh, open cavity of a body when we're embalming it after it's had an autopsy so that any fluid that goes in will just get pulled in way to go. Usually these are called non-clogging. Uh, because of the large holes or large slots they have in them, and hands free. We drop them in place and we forget about them, so to speak. You should be able to list in order of least able to clog, likely to clog, every trocar we've talked about. So at the upper range, you have the autopsy aspirator, which absolutely is the hardest one to clog up. You have and the full-size trocar, okay, the full-size trocar, the infant trocar and or hypovalve trocar would probably fall into this category as well, and then finally, the nasal tube aspirator at the very, very bottom of the list. So it talks about your anatomy, and you guys should know most of this by now. Uh, know the parts. Know what they contain. You know, you need to know this stuff. This should not be something new. Same thing about the lungs, the heart. Um, abdomen contains the digestive organs, and it's important that you know that the stomach is not just locked into the body. It swishes and swirls around, so it changes in relation to the position and orientation of your body. When you're laying down, your stomach is in one place. When you are standing up, your stomach is in another place. Um, know the parts of the small intestine. That would be important. Uh, small intestine and stomach are supported by mesentery to hold, kind of hold them where they have to go. Uh, but again, the stomach does change its orientation according to where you stand. The small intestines, not so much. They're kind of locked down more. Uh, large intestine, know these terms, especially the ones that I'm kind of throwing at you, like the epiploic appendices, haustra, you know, their saculations, the tania coli, the muscles that kind of hold things in place. These would be important things that you may not have even heard in the anatomy class or, you know, recall from anatomy class. But... Write this stuff down in note cards. Know what they are. Know the parts of it. Know the parts and some of the um, subparts of the large intestine. Where is the appendix? The full name of the appendix being the vermiform appendix, um, etc. Liver, largest glandular organ in the body is your liver. Tells you the regions. We're going to look at the regions uh, in a second. Uh, the upper surface is higher on the right than on the left, so it's kind of at an angle. Gallbladder. Know where it is, what it does. Same thing with the pancreas and the spleen, your kidneys, um, super renal gland, pelvis. Yep. So your pelvis now contains some extra things you need to worry about. Prostate, seminal vesicles, urinary bladder, and rectum. Tells you what these things are, where they go. Um, some little triggers. Some little triggers. Do not tell me that men have a uterus, please. Uh, people sometimes get in the heat of the test, and then they tell me that in the pregnant male that the uterus changes according to, yeah, the pregnant males may be something in the future, but they don't exist right now uh, in the traditional sense of the term. I understand with things like transgender and whatnot that these type of options can happen, but we are looking at this from the biological standpoint. So, the divisions. We looked at the chart about, you know, where the um, purge originates from, long brain, stomach, what it looks like, etc. This is the next big thing that you need to know, okay? There are two methods. The first one is the nine region, okay? And it tells you how to draw it. Basically, you draw tic-tac-toe over the abdomen. There it is, okay? And here are your divisions. Here are your divisions, all of them. And I separate them into the highest the hypochondriacs and the gastric, okay, to the lumbar and the umbilical, the middle, finally the inguinal or iliac 
and the hypogastric. Now, the middle ones take care of themselves. Epigastric, above the stomach, you know, so to speak. Umbilical, right in the middle, and then hypogastric. That's pretty much easy. The inguinal or iliac ones take care of themselves because those are over the hips. All you have to kind of keep straight in your head is the lumbar and the hypochondriac. Lumbar are going to be above the pelvis, and then the hypochondriac are at the top. Yes, you will have to know what things fall into what categories. Okay? So you need to know where the liver sits with these different types of areas. So the liver obviously is in all these upper ones. The greater omentum is in, I believe, every single one of these items. So look for things that kind of stand out. And if you have spent some time staring at kind of one of the slides of anatomy, like where they show the organs within an environment like this, you should be able to visualize fairly accurately and give a good educated guess for most of the stuff there. But nothing's going to be note carding and just beating it to death. The other one is the quadrant method, four region plan. And that looks like this. Okay, That looks like this. Much easier. Much easier to kind of remember. Um, and now come the choke card guides. So outside of the regions, okay, what you should be able to draw from memory, even if you can't remember some of the organs that are in these things, if you can't draw the tic-tac-toe thing here and put in all the initials, that, that's a problem. Trocar guides are something different. All originate from the common trocar insertion point, two inches left and two inches up. Two to the left, two up, common insertion. Okay? point of the trocar is kept close to the anterior abdominal wall unless the, until the specific organ you're trying to pierce is reached. So the heart, the key thing to the heart is your look for iliac spine and earlobe. Okay? Iliac spine and earlobe. Yes, it can pass through the diaphragm and enter the heart after that, but if you see that first part, superior iliac spine and right or left earlobe, you know, right side of the heart, obviously, is right earlobe, left side would be the other. Um, you know it's the heart. The stomach, intercostal, the intercostal space, the left mid-axillary line. But if you can remember intercostal, that separates it from the heart. We're, we're lower on the body. We're in the ribs. Cecum, large intestine. This one has a lot of stuff. And if you just remember, this is the one with the most garbage. You probably do yourself well because if you memorize the urinary bladder, and just remember a medial line of the pubic bone or a midline of the body and depress, that's probably going to do well for your urinary bladder every single time. So if you remember three of them, the cecum is going to take care of itself. So what happens if you have some swelling or some other problems where you might have to do a partial aspiration? Well, you can relieve some of the pressure by getting rid of some of the gas in the intestines and whatnot. So there's two methods. One, use a scalpel, puncture the abdomen at that standard point of entry, and insert the trocar blunt instrument and release the gases. Maybe easier if you do it in the inguinal area, even lower, okay, below, not too left and too up, but actually right on the pelvis itself. Um, it is what it is. Make an incision in the abdominal wall and dissect the cavity, okay? Uh, you can get right into the guts, cut it open, cover the opening with gas. Method one is usually a lot easier, much cleaner, much make you happier in the long run. You don't have to sniff as much. Um, subcutaneous emphysema, gases in the chest. Well, that may cause all sorts of good stuff, distension, protruding tongue, uh, and even the scrotum can be filled with gas. With subcutaneous emphysema, you have the swelling, but you do not have odor, and that is the trigger. Okay? Look for punctures, needle marks in the rib cage, all sorts of stuff. All this is is air. It is not decom. Uh, it's brought about by the rupture or tearing of the pleural sac of the lung, and the air is forced into the tissues. Typically, EMTs might do this if they're doing uh, chest compressions. They'll crack some ribs and force some gas in there. And you probably want to try to remove some of the gas if it's so bad do you think it's going to interfere with um, arterial embalming? It tells you how to insert the trocar. And the, and the key trick here is that always keep it towards the anterior portion of the body. You want to keep it as close to the skin as possible. Um, obviously, using a carotid incision, if the gas creeps up towards the neck, it will come out of the incision at that point, and that may aid you in the process. 
removal can be better accomplished by channeling or lancing after injection is completed. Most certainly. Once you're done injecting the body um, and you just let the gas kind of sit, you know, let it sit for a couple of hours while the arterial solution does its job, you can go through and then, you know, push it out later if you need to. Begin aspiration prior to suturing incisions that were made for arterial injection. Takes the pressure off vasculature and decreases leakage. Um, we'll talk again about that. My favorite is to kind of put that right up into the neck, put the trocar into the neck and hold it right underneath my incision just to catch anything. You can do cavity treatment immediately after arterial injection or you can wait several hours. I'm a big fan of waiting if you can. So what are the pros? Pros for doing immediate arterial injection or um, immediate cavity treatment. And it lists everything. For the most part, you get rid of everything that could cause decomp immediately. That is the nutshell. Decreases swelling due to any variety of things. Removes the blood um, that might be pooling, uh, which may help you with formaldehyde gray. Well, what about the delay? Better diffusion. The arterial chemical does its job better because the pressure retains uh, in the arterial system longer, which forces things to distribute in the fuse. And it also makes organs to pierce since they have preserved somewhat. So it talks about the standard point of entry. I'm just going to let you kind of read that in the book. Um, it says now and then withdraw the trocar, let air get in there and kind of suck and push some of the stuff through. You can flush it with water. Just whatever you want to do in your practice. Gases are found in the anterior portions will go figure your laying down gases are going to be at the top liquids to the posterior um, and make sure that when you are doing your trocar aspiration if you have the body I'm just going to run back and find this guy right here kind of separate your body into three levels and what it's saying in that slide is channel one two and three up here go down the middle get some down here and then go right to the base and get as much as you can down there that way, you have sufficiently pierced things so that um, later on when you put the cavity fluid in there, all those holes will allow the cavity fluid to penetrate and do their job. It also makes sure that you did thorough aspiration and got out as much as you can. So if you've had recent surgery or organ removal, and there are whole chapters dedicated to organ tissue donation, we'll see that later. Uh, disinfect with a cauterizing solution and it walks you through the various steps to get this done. We're going to talk more about this in a separate chapter, so I'm kind of not going to beat it to death. Uh, we're going to talk about the direct incision method. Method occurs, uh, or just use an incision to aspirate the cavity, and then we suture um, and then inject. Your book states this is unsanitary and time consuming with no access to both the abdominal and thoracic cavities. Um, yeah, I see no reason why we need to go ahead and cut open the body and then aspirate everything so we can see what happens, and then go do the other one, and then it just sounds like a waste of time, especially when um, proper trocar aspiration injection works just peachy. We have no real order of treatment, but we know that we start at the top, we work our way south, we do the three levels, we fan, you know, right to left, etc. Um, in the past, we would concentrate on one organ at a time and make sure it was effective. Um, Suggested order, the way we've seen it throughout the, uh, this chapter, is top, middle, bottom for aspiration and injection. So read the sequence of aspiration at home. Okay, I'm not going to beat this one to death for you. Uh, keep the instrument in motion. That's the big thing, is that by pushing the trocar, you're actually forcing whatever's in there to kind of push itself back a little. That assists the suction. Um, the liver is difficult to preserve. You're going to have to really just sit there and poke lots of holes in it because it is solid. And the small intestine, being um, a large amount of basically hollow tissue, will tend to clog the small holes. So to build up um, some pressure and also to make sure that you actually pierce it, sometimes you have to put uh, your hand on the abdomen and push down a little while you try to puncture the internal areas. You might even need to push down and then I uh, use the bone of the spine or the bones of the pelvis to kind of force the trocar through those hollow areas don't slide around. Uh, it talks about that right there. So what happens with the scrotum? We do not have to treat the scrotum individually every single case. The male scrotum does not have to have the trocar rammed into it in order to preserve it. 
Um, if you have hydroseal, which it talks about later, okay, you are going to have to get in there and channel so that you can get some fluid in there. If there's a hernia, that can be pretty much a pain in the butt as well. Cranial aspiration, we go in through the nose, plain and simple. We push the trocar through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone into the head. We cannot get into the back portion of the head. If we jump all the way back to the picture that shows, um, or there it is, next one, you can see that this body is supposed to be lying down. We're not going to be able to get into, from that position going in through the nose, any of the space back here. We're only going to be able to hit anything in this upper portion. So it's kind of no harm, no foul. Um, and make sure you understand, we're not talking about the 18-inch. We're talking about the infant or hypovalve trocar um, so that we are getting the least amount of trauma with what we're doing. Cavity chemical is always used non-diluted. Uh, anything in the body is going to dilute it, so you don't want to play with it. On average, a 150-pound body should have 16 ounces injected in three major cavities. We about this. This is one of those matters of debate that we're always bouncing off of each other about, you know, what are they asking on professional exams. Um, the abdomen, the pelvis, and the thorax are three separate cavities. So one bottle for each under this method. Where I know there are other general rules where it's basically one up and one down, one in the thorax and one in the abdomen. Uh, larger bodies should get more, smaller bodies should get less. Obviously, if the body cannot hold the contents of a bottle, a bottle and a half of cavity fluid, because they are large, you may not want to go in immediately and try to waste four bottles of cavity fluid. You probably have to re-aspirate and re-inject. So use some good judgment here. Prior to injection, flush the trocar. You want to make sure it works before you start pushing in you know, the, uh, the high formaldehyde cavity fluid. Injection may be gravity or machine. Generally, use a gravity injector. Um, higher the bottle, faster it flows. Also, the more you move the trocar, the faster it flows. And make sure you get your thumb off the hole. I love newbies when they put their thumb over the hole and they wonder why nothing's leaking out. Um, and then, you know, starts leaking all over themselves. So, good times. Put your finger over the hole, flip it upside down, raise it up high, let the hole go. It's kind of like shifting a motorcycle, and away you go. Afterwards, Rinse the injector tube and trocar disperse fluid and then sterilize your trocar accordingly. With the machine, you drop it in your machine and you inject it. Generally, this voids your manufacturer's warranty. They don't want you using cavity fluid in your embalming machine. You are setting your pressure and rate of flow if you do this very low. And afterwards, you're most certainly going to use warm water and ammonia to neutralize whatever's in there and then flush the machine again. What you've seen was, you know, a good practice um, in another chapter. Chemicals are basically sprayed. You know, if you want to see what, how the trocar works, just get an empty bottle of um, maybe a water corrective or a co-injection solution. Fill it with water, put in your gravity injector, and then bring it up and watch it come out of the trocar. And you'll see what this is talking about. Then the fluid will gravitate. It'll flow all over the place and get into the holes made during your aspiration. Uh, sometimes after even the bottles are done, you'll ram the um, trocar around a couple more times just so that it makes things flow, makes some more holes, etc. Uh, and you should cover the open end of the trocar with cloth to protect against fumes and microbes. Sometimes people will put a little towel right above the hole, have their trocar button and applicator handy, and as they pull it out, they cover it real quick before they go in. Again, um, there are different ways we can do things. By turning the body on its back, you kind of slosh things around to make sure that uh, the fluid gets everywhere it needs to get. It also brings gases to the surface, which is what you want, so that later on, if you do need to re-aspirate, you get it right out. Do not allow the cavity fluid to run across the skin, especially in the abdomen. Uh, one, it's a hazard for you. Get it off as soon as possible. Flush it, wipe it down, boom. It is possible to inject cavity fluid into the trach or esophagus. Um, Flush surface with cold water, repack area tightly. Limited aspiration can happen via the nasal aspirate, but don't be afraid to open up the throat and do what you need to do uh, to make sure that you've hit the base of the throat. I personally have never done this um, in regards to trying to inject cavity chemical through the mouth. I will just replace my packing and re-aspirate you know, and go from there. So it talks about doing a purse string or reverse, stretch to uh, reverse stitch to close it. 
Um, I typically tie a bow in case I do need to reopen it because obviously a trocar button may not seal afterwards. And I like the trocar buttons over the stitches every single day. Um, just so much easier to use. If you do have a pre-existing hole, say from a feeding tube or something, um, you know, use it. Use the hole that you got. I know the book says do the standard point of entry, but you can essentially do what you need to do from any hole that's already there if you don't want to make another hole. I don't know why that bothers me making more holes. Uh, typically, if I do see a feeding tube professionally, I will use that rather than making another hole. If you do leave something open, cover the opening uh, with a cloth. And generally, you're doing this so that the gases will just pass right out of the body and not cause swelling. Uh, obviously, you don't want to do this and throw them in a shipping container and then put them on an airplane. I mean, no brainer. Read the list as to why you would re aspirate, uh, re inject. This is extremely important. Uh, it'll be parroted throughout other chapters. So, again, anytime you touch something like this um, with a list of review, it helps you as a student to get this locked in. Folks, thank you for your attention. We'll see you in the next chapter.